welcome everyone to Park Forum. This is our eighth talk in our special speaker series on going beyond Web 2.0, the power of the web for connecting people, collaboratively co-creating knowledge, enabling organizations to use social computing tools more effectively, and more. So previous talks in our speaker series are available or will soon be available in our online archive at www.park.com slash forums. That's F-O-R-U-M-S. And these talks include Social Tech's Ross Mayfield on how all things Web 2.0 are made of people, Garrett Camp on the Stumble Upon Web Discovery System, Guy Kawasaki on the numbers of launching a web-based business, BJ Fogg on mass interpersonal persuasion, Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wattenberg on democratizing visualizations, Bernardo Huberman on social dynamics in the age of the web, and Charlene Lee of Forrester on strategies for winning in a world transformed by social technologies. Today's talk will also be included online. But before introducing today's speaker, I want to remind you that there will be no Park Forum next week. We'll resume on the 21st with Andrew McAfee of Harvard Business School. Now on to today's talk. As many of you know, those regulars in the audience, we've tried to represent different viewpoints and perspectives in this series, covering different technologies, approaches, and business models. We invited Kiva because we were intrigued by how this nonprofit organization is using the web to facilitate data-rich, transparent connections between micro-lenders and entrepreneurs in the developing world. Kiva's microfinance approach, which enables lenders to see who their money goes to and what the recipients are doing with it, has yielded a 99% repayment rate on over $21 million of loans. As president of Kiva.org, our speaker, Premal Shah, leads Kiva's efforts to scale its partnerships and member base. Prior to Kiva, Premal was a principal product manager at PayPal, where he drove numerous corporate initiatives, including a project defining eBay's role in economically empowering the global working poor. Before joining PayPal, Premal was a strategy consultant at Mercer Management Consulting, uh, Management Consulting in New York City, and more recently, he co-founded the Silicon Valley Microfinance Network. So without further delay, let's welcome Premal. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Sonal and I actually knew each other back in New York. I'm surprised she left that uh, out, in the, out of the bio. But uh, I dated her best friend, and uh, it didn't work out. And um, I. Is that her fault? <laughs> um, so, anyways, it's it's an honor to be here. Um, how many of you folks have actually heard of Kiva or, or have been to the website? Cool. Um, so, so it, for, for the folks here who um, haven't heard of it or haven't really um, made a loan or played around with the site, I just thought I would start by going through the website because um, uh, within Kiva, our offices are based in, in the Mission District in San Francisco. It's really a bunch of, um, I would say, technologists and, and kind of people who have experience in consumer internet companies, um, not necessarily people who actually have a lot of experience in development and microfinance. And I think us stumbling into development and microfinance, um, um, you know, perhaps we're too naive, or, or it, 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 in large reason, I think it, it's the reason why Akiva has actually grown as, as much as it has. Um, we've taken some, I think, unconventional approaches to, um, to this that maybe folks in DC uh, uh, initially uh, didn't quite agree with or uh, think it would scale. Um, here, so the, the site in a nutshell is, is, is it's an eBay for microfinance. Um, you can go to the site and you can scroll through and see entrepreneurs from now about 42 countries around the world. Uh, Kiva itself is about uh, three years old now. And, um, oh wow, uh, I didn't even know, but we're in Benin now and that just happened today. So you can click on Antoinette here and um, Benin, which is in West Africa. Um, you can read, that's not a great photo of her, but she is a tailor. Um, and um, essentially, you can read about uh, Antoinette here. So Mrs. Antoinette Topanau, truly a jack of all trades, is serious about her work as a stress, and you can read kind of more about her. Um, it was uploaded in French probably just a few days ago. Um, and then we have kind of an open source translator team, about 250 people who um, are volunteers who speak French or Spanish or um, Indonesian, and essentially they will translate this content before it renders onto the website. And th so now it was it was published onto the website uh, February 6th, so not too long ago. And in that time, uh, this woman um, has raised 
she was seeking um, you know, a $1,500 loan, and uh, of that, about $850 was raised. There's $300 still to go. And if you were interested in her story or backing her business um, and making a 0% loan, you could select from the drop down uh, you know, $25 or more and kind of add that to your basket, just like you buy a book on Amazon um, and check out. This was posted by a field partner, otherwise known as a microfinance institution. Um, this, again, is just brand new to me. It just appeared today. We have about 85 field partners, again, in 42 countries, a lead day. Um, and you can see that their time on Kiva is zero months, and they've, they have about 23 entrepreneurs that they've rendered onto the website. And in that time, in the short amount of time, they've raised about $10,000. Um, and you can see the other lenders to this business right now. So this all kind of appeared in the last day. And why don't we take a look at Emily's family here. So this is Emily's family. It looks like it's um, you know, actually a number of people um, who are related to Emily here from Santa Barbara, California. And they fill out why they've loaned, um, you know, who they are. And this is, I guess, an unusual case, because this family, their portfolio has 1,700 Kiva loans. Um, Definitely unusual. The average Kiva lender has 2.2 loans, so I'm, I'm definitely picking a, a great one. But you know, as you can see, um, the whole idea is within your E-Trade account, you have this portfolio, and why can't you have a portfolio of the informal sector in the developing world? Um, this is just Kiva year three. It's very, very basic, but I think there's so much that we can do around real data, not like this poverty pornography that you know you're often fed from the save well from. The, his, the kind of the traditional view of it. I, I think really emphasizing entrepreneurism, business, um, data-rich statistics. I'd love to see kind of uh, you know net income changes. I'd love to see you know much more rich data on 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 folks who uh, don't often have that data collected and certainly rendered on a public platform. And I think there's there's things that we could do here um, that would make people's portfolios um, even more interesting. I mean, one thing I would one thing I kind of dig about Kiva is so Emily's family has an investment, as you see uh, on this line, two investments in Kenya. And one thing that we're going for with Kiva is right now in Kenya, there's a lot of turmoil, a lot of political turmoil because of the, the, the recent elections. And uh, there are riots, there, there are, um, you know, it, it's, it's actually quite a violent situation. And the idea, hopefully, with Kiva is that someone in Des Moines, Iowa now actually cares a little bit more about what's happening in Kenya in the world section of their newspaper because they got a $25 stake in a business out there. And, and, and a loan creates a persistent tie to, even if it's a $25 zero percent interest loan, it creates a persistent tie to, uh, to, to, to someone around the world. Um, and and you know, it's too soon to tell what kind of effect this could have on, on consciousness here in the States and, and, and in other uh, places where the, our lenders are coming from. But, um, that's kind of one of the things we hope to achieve. Anyway, so once you make a loan on the website, going back there, um, uh, you know, we'll look at um, this uh, clothing salesperson uh, right here. Well, once you make a loan on the site um, and you check out, um, you will get it in your portfolio. And then over time, you'll get journal updates. Um, so not only do you, I think the whole thesis is that um, not only is a loan a persistent tie and information gets back, because if, if you're getting repaid, you know something's working. And if you're not getting repaid, you know something's not working, which is also interesting, too. Um, and, and so what we want to do is um, also kind of provide additional color on you know, what's going on with your business, just like if you invested, again, in IBM, you'd get quarterly updates on how it's doing. That following that whole business metaphor is, is really important to us. So um, you get these journal updates and you get repaid. And as Sonal mentioned, right now the repayment rate is um, is is very high. It's 99.7% on the site. I, I fear that that's because there is actually um, the this data is being self-reported, essentially. A lot of these microfinance institutions around the world, Kiva's getting so much attention in the press that they don't want to look bad. Um, I mean, it, 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 the data actually at this point I think is not very believable. Um, what we want to do is actually create more incentives around transparency. Um, our mantra at Kiva is that unreliable credit is okay, unreliable data is not okay. So if, if the money was embezzled, if the money um, you know, was used for a consumptive reason, not a productive reason, just be honest and let 
the people know. And, and I think if you can create that kind of integrity around this platform, people will trust it even more. They're, they're tell, you'll trust the good data when it's told um, when you hear bad data as well. And so um, that's what we're tr trying to strive towards is much more meaningful data on the website. Um, I think that the real repayment rates around in microfinance are still plus 90%. But I don't think it's 99%, which is what our site shows, and which is what a lot of the microfinance uh, institutions around the world, all these NGOs, feel a lot of pressure to report because no one else seems to be. So it's it's one of the things in the nascent industry that I think we'll see more real data over time. Um, so uh, let's see here. You can always buy give Kiva gift certificates. Just in December alone, we sold two million dollars of Kiva gift certificates, which. Um, is really cool because uh, you know uh, you can give it to say uh, your child, and they will invest in uh, someone in uh, you know in Kenya here, and then that money will be paid back uh, each month over ten months, and then they can reinvest or pull out that money. So that's been a pretty popular feature. So now that I've kind of given an overview of the website, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. One of the pages that um, we're proud about is. The Risk and Due Diligence Center. Um, I don't think our users look at this, but we really, again, want to start creating a lot more, s really blending the world of, you know, I guess not hardcore finance, but you know, a lot of the st uh, data-rich statistics with poverty, which is m a much more of an emotional pull, and really blur those lines, um, so that people are really trying to choose. Um, y y people are weighing emotional return versus financial return versus social return. Um, you know, I, I often think that, for example. Right now on the website, women get funded uh, 2.4 times faster than men. Is that a rational decision? Is that based on an affinity thing? I mean, there is a lot of data that shows that women who receive loans not only are more likely to repay that loan back, but actually that translates to higher nutritional values in the home. Just by, by a lot of the social indicators around that family, that household, are actually much better um, with women when women receive loans and increase their agency versus men. So maybe it is a rational decision. Uh, Kenyans get funded about 10.8 times faster than Bulgarians. What's going on is that you know uh, agriculture gets funded 3.4 times faster than transportation or taxis. So it's interesting to watch when you have 20 to 30 thousand people a day hitting this website, how they're parsing through the data and how they're choosing to um, to, to lend um, at this point. Um, this says 15.2 hours to fully fund a loan. I, this basically what that what that means is on average. Um, when a profile is posted on the website, it's funded by kind of 20 individuals around the internet in less than one day. So the rate of, to use kind of inven uh, e eBay speak, the rate of inventory turn, not that these people are inventory, but if, if you take a pure marketplace stance on this, is just phenomenal on this website, um, which is really exciting. Um, it's really empowering, I think it's really disempowering to make a loan to someone only to have it sit there for you know, 45 days and not know if it's ever gonna get funded. It's much more fun and addictive, and I think that's part of the secret sauce, of Kiva. When you and you know the community of individuals all over the world are like, are, are scrambling to fund these different businesses. It creates a kind of momentum around it, which is why it's powerful to not have, you know, these, you know, $10,000 loans, but to keep the loan sizes very small on the website because your $25 divided by that, uh, that denominator of, you know, a $1,000 loan or $400 loans feels like you're really making a dent as opposed to, you know, when you hear about these millennium development goals of billions of dollars, as, as a reader in Des Moines, Iowa, that's just a disempowering number. It's too big of a denominator for me to make an impact in. So um, th those are some of the other things that we think about at Kiva. All right, so I've, I've kind of jumped around a lot. Let me, um, let me uh, try to do, whoop, that's our performance. Uh, no, it's not there. there we go. <laughs> um, so I will um, take you through some of the, the stats. As, as I mentioned, the, the goal is to connect the internet lender with the developing world entrepreneur, but ultimately, really, just to create an internet public good, much like Wikipedia has, um, where there are folks from the developing world lending to people in Louisiana. And it's just basically a pool of capital um, that's swirling around the system, um, touching lives, uh, touching folks who, who live in poverty no matter where they live. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the end goal. Um, and, and today it's intermediated by these local field partners, these microfinance institutions. Long term when the technology actually gets there where you can actually transfer money to a cell phone and that person can then cash those funds at a local uh, retailer, you could actually disintermediate, or if there was like local credit bureaus, you could disintermediate 
the, the institution have true person-to-person -person lending, which is, I think, the, the promise of, of uh, well, I think we'll see that in the next 10 years. Um, the, 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 um, this, the, the, the value proposition to the social investor, I think the, the, the number one thing we hear about why people dig Kiva is it's the transparency. People want to know where their money goes. Um, um, and, 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 and there's some other reasons. These intermediaries, these microfinance institutions who are posting up the, the profiles of these entrepreneurs, for them, it's a way to acquire low-cost US dollar capital. Um, so I just got back from Uganda. And uh, these NGOs that, are, uh, that I visited that were lending to the poor, they lent to the poor at 35% interest, which sounds very high to us. But the informal credit market, the, the, the village moneylender, the loan shark, was lending at about 100 to 200%. So it was much cheaper. But then you ask that local microfinance institution, which is a nonprofit, it's an NGO, and they're supposed to be doing something that's socially good. Why is your interest rate 35%? And they say, well, look, well, there's two big costs of running this, this lending operation. The first is the administrative cost. These are bankers on bicycles who bike out to the village and collect on a weekly basis from groups of women. So that's about half our cost. But the other half of our cost is the cost of funds. They have to borrow money from Stanvik Bank, which is a big bank. It's like a city bank in, in Uganda at 17% interest. Um, and then they pay Stanvik Bank back at 17% interest rate. So half of that 35% cost structure is the cost of capital that these NGOs are paying. And there's about 10,000 of these NGOs around the world that are lending to the poor. And their cost of capital, because it's risky lending, is, is quite high from the local banks. And so in comes an internet model um, like Kiva, where you can take this information, put it on the web, and folks like us can actually fund it at a much lower interest rate, a, dis a disruptively lower interest rate. The thesis being that people are better in banks. People value an emotional return that banks don't. And people don't have cost structures on the internet that banks do that they need to support their cost. Uh, that you know that Stanbic Bank has brick and mortar uh, costs, and which is why they need to charge 17% to the NGO, who then onlines it at 35%. So, so you know, for the microfinance institution, it's basically low cost uh, capital that they're able to acquire over the internet. Um, the second is that they don't bear a liability. The liability is borne by us in the room. So if someone defaults on Kiva. We eat that, not the, not the NGO, not the microfinance institution. That's, that's attractive. Um, they set the repayment terms based on what their clients want. And final, finally, what we really want to drive is a lot more transparency in the industry. So we try to provide more financial incentives around being transparent. Again, we don't penalize them if they have a high delinquency or default rate. We actually, um, we actually almost want to reward that kind of behavior on our website um, and celebrate honesty. So here's Kiva's growth. Um, um, this this um, is essentially we've been growing. Um, I guess there's a parabolic growth uh, curve, but basically every every um, I don't know 10 or 12 days now we're raising about a million dollars over the internet. Um, it took us in year one the full year to raise our first million dollars. So um, that's really exciting. I think the other thing that's very exciting is that. This money um, is actually is repaid um, usually within a year. And um, only 10% of our lenders are withdrawing that money. Most people are actually reloaning that money. So Kiva's building this, this kind of compound loan fund, essentially, which will, you know, each year you can almost guarantee that it'll just double on top of the, the as the word spreads and you tell your friends, you know, our, our, you'll even have new lo daily loan origination. So where we think we can be in, one, in, in about five years, conservatively, we think we'll be at about a $250 million. Um, but aggressively, we think we might be able to hit a billion dollars in five years, which, which is crazy to me, because this started off as a real side project, totally unintentional, no PowerPoint, just a cool thing to do um, you know, with some friends. And um, to put that in perspective, Citibank's microfinance portfolio is $100 million today. So, um, you know, people powered capital, $25 at a time, can actually be uh, more significant uh, by a factor of several X in five years than one of the world's largest institutional plays in microfinance. And I think that's incredibly humbling and powerful um, and, and, and something that, you know, we see in other industries that the, that the internet, great internet models have touched. Um, here's just kind of our, our traffic. Uh, growth as well. Um, we, we, you know, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, just like Wikipedia is a 501c3 nonprofit. Wikipedia has four employees. 
um, yet one out of every 200 pages served on the internet is a Wikipedia page load. It is, you know, its goal is to basically make access to information completely free, um, so you don't have to be part of the elite to, to, you know, you can be in any country ideally with an internet connection and learn about anything. That's a, that's a, and, and I think Kiva, you know, very much so. Um, in 2006, our first year, we spent $186,000, less than $200,000 running Kiva, um, and we unearthed about $2 million from the internet that year, and. Um, and, and, and you know, in large part because we are here in the Valley and we were able to find companies that would basically chip in um, with you know, what they knew how to do well and they would give it to us for free. So PayPal gives us free payment processing. Huge for us because we have no variable costs. So we can send money, you, know, you can send money from Columbus, Ohio to Uganda essentially and, and there's minimal friction in that system. That's allowed us to actually do this. Um, YouTube and Google and Yahoo have provided um, a ton of kind of free marketing for us, essentially. Again, just driving traffic. The problem with creating a marketplace what is no NGO, no microfinance institution will ever sign up and post people on the internet if no one's coming to our website. And so we had this chicken and egg problem in the beginning, which is we would try to ask people in the developing world, hey, would you post up photos of entrepreneurs in your community? And they'd be like, that's, that's going to be a total waste of my time. How do I know it's going to get funded? And luckily, um, you know, companies that have uh, a lot of people hitting their sites have um, kind of shared some of those, some of that traffic with us. Um, other companies have made kind of hardware donations. Um, if you guys, any of you here work for a company that you fantastic, because if we can lower our cost structure, then, you know, it basically, um, I think the leverage, uh, what we think about is the leverage ratio, which is for every one dollar it costs to run Kiva, to pay for our rent in San Francisco and the actually running the operations, how many dollars can we unearth in loan capital? And today it's about a 10 to 1 leverage ratio, but you know, I'd love to get that even higher and higher and just prove out how an internet model can be one of the most efficient ways that donors can make a difference. Um, we got, also got lucky with press. We, we joke around that we, don't, we, we never really got to go down Sand Hill Road and raise money from folks. We were a nonprofit. It was kind of a crazy idea. Um, there isn't, it was very hard to keep up with the growth and we couldn't get growth capital quickly. But I think um, the press actually just injected a ton of attention on, on our site. Um, and, and so in light of not having, you know, being able to kind of do a series B or a series A round, um, we were able to basically um, um, have our community donate an optional 10% every time they come through and make a loan. And so far, about 70% of our community members donate a 10% on top of the loan that they're making. And in December, uh, we were about 70% financially self-sufficient just through our community revenues. Um, so we really credit the, the press for being our VCs in a way, for sending a lot of people to our site um, and then charging little fees here and there. Um, here's our footprint around the world. Um, there are some countries that are actually difficult to get into. Uh, personally, for me, India, we still are not there because of uh, Indian government regulations. Um, basically, the BRIC countries, uh, Brazil, India, China, uh, many of these countries actually have very difficult re uh, regulations around getting money out of the country. They're fine getting, having you put money in, but getting money out even at 0% interest has been challenging. So, so it's limited where we can go, but this is where we've been in about two to three years here. Um, here's a list, just to get it really concrete, of real NGOs or microfinance institutions that are on the platform today. And one question that I get is, how do you guys do your due diligence on these microfinance institutions? Um, and so essentially what we have at the, at the center of it all is a risk model. And I think PayPal fundamentally is a risk management company. It's got a, a nice simple UI that, you know, um, that Consumer America understands or the, the, the internet public understands. But fundamentally they learn how to manage risk really well. And one third of PayPal's 8,000 employees is just doing risk management every single day. I think Kiva in many ways is a risk management company too, where it's our job to go and vet all of these microfinance institutions around the world, and then they're vetting all the entrepreneurs and posting them up from the website so that we can give the internet community um, safe, reliable data um, that they can then make informed decisions on. So essentially, um, these microfinance institutions, otherwise known as MFIs, they but they give us self-reported data. They, we ask third-party data. Um, so you know, um, we ask for auditor information, radar information. A lot of times it doesn't exist. 
Um, this is a very nascent industry. And then we look at MFI performance on Kiva. Just like on eBay, you look at the eBay seller feedback, and that develops their credibility. Essentially, we have um, a, a feedback system, that, that five-star system over there. And the idea is that each one of these microfinance institutions around the world right now, the information is really thin, but we could create a data-rich platform on their creditworthiness and how well they can lend to the poor. Um, um, and, and, and that sets kind of a monthly fundraising limit. So if you have five stars, you can raise $150,000 a month. Uh, as a local microfinance institution, if you have one star, you can only raise $2,000 a month. And as you prove your creditworthiness, you can post up more and more profiles of entrepreneurs from your community and raise more money. Um, so here's kind of basically some portfolio averages for Kiva at that microfinance institution level. Um, the, the average field partner on our website has been a partner uh, for 7.5 months. They've raised about $180,000 in capital. They've paid back about 69,000. So they've collected that from the entrepreneurs and posted it back to Kiva. And they've posted about 215 businesses. And so we have about 80 partners right now. Um, the distribution of stars is we have two one-star partners all the way down to 25-star partners. And um, it's kind of weighted towards four and fives. So basically, um, microfinance, just to give kind of the one slide overview of the microfinance industry, um, which is pioneered by Mohammed Yunus of the uh, Grameen Bank, uh, who started kind of microfinance as we know it today 30 years ago. But now there's 10,000 of these organizations, 10,000 other Grameen banks around the world, and it's growing at about 20% a year. It's just flourishing. And the, the big picture is, is that the estimated number of borrowers in need of a loan of kind of microfinance services that can't get money from their local city bank that are shut out of the formal financial sector is about 500 million people on Earth, so about 1 in 12 people. Um, and right now, what's being served is about 100 million. So there's a supply-demand imbalance. And if you look at who's serving them, there's a few really big ones, like Grameen Bank. But the, but the, the vast majority are serving less than 2,500 borrowers. So it's this huge industry of a lot of uh, microfinance institutions around the world. And they're serving, they're serving just, they're like small little community banks. And the problem with ha getting them to scale, essentially, one of their biggest problems is access to, to, to capital that they can lend on to the poor. If they had more capital, they would lend more to the poor in their community. Um, but they can't get capital because they're so small and they have no credit rating themselves. And so the local banks and Wall Street won't, won't talk to them. And this is why an internet platform can actually give them some kind of credit history. So the whole th the thought with Kiva is that Kiva, because we're assembling people who value kind of people who are much more, people are more risk tolerant than banks um, when you're trying to do good. We can actually aggregate that capital and put that in much more riskier situations than the conservative financial institutions out there. And that, that basically would, would allow these, these, uh, these microfinance institutions to scale at a, ra a much more rapid pace and achieve, achieve kind of self-sufficiency and scale and then be able to tap the capital markets long term. So that's a, kind of a lot of industry, microfinance industry speak there. But I think it's kind of an important point about what Kiva's role as an industry, kind of eBay, um, what its role is in terms of you know, where we focus this money amongst the 10,000 microfinance institutions out there. Um, really cool story about technology, some unintended consequence of Kiva, which is in the first village that we started in, in Tororo, Uganda, um, there was an internet cafe there. And this is where basically a pastor posted up photos of uh, entrepreneurs in his congregation. This is how Kiva got started. Um, about three years ago now. And what's really interesting about this internet cafe is that you only see really kind of people in their like late teens, uh, in their 20s, essentially college age students, but you never see folks kind of over the age of 40 in the Tororo, Uganda um, internet cafe. But now with Kiva, they're actually coming in and they ask the attendant to pull up Kiva. And they actually love to watch, look at their photos, look at their own repayment statistics and watch how their friends in the village are also repaying. <laughs> because they know that if their friends in the village repay, they're going to be eligible for more loans over the internet. And that their reputation as a community is going to go up or down based on their friends' repayments. And so Kiva is actually, totally unintended consequence, has actually become a virtual bulletin board on people's creditworthiness in Toro or Uganda. So I think there's just, you know, it's, it's one of these things that you can never really predict, but I think there's so many opportunities because it's, it's relevant. Because money's coming through this computer, 
like I have very much, I have a lot of reason to come in and learn this computer. Like you can't just drop a computer in a village and think it's wired. It has to be, what's the killer app? What's the relevant thing? And, and certainly access to loan capital so you can grow your business and provide for your family. Um, that, that seems to be, um, that seems to be um, a thing, uh, something that attracts people's interests. So um, that's, that's a cool story. Um, this is uh, just basically a slide on some of our future performas. Um, I won't get into that. Um, this is a, an outdated slide, but the, the key point at the top is what's the risk right now? So I mean, we're, you know, um, you know we're, we want to be great stewards of Kiva. Um, we're not going it's, it's not trying to IPO or anything. It's, it's truly an internet public good like Wikipedia. Um, and the number one risk is execution. It's basically, um, all the things that probably YouTube and all these other companies faced where, you know, you have a lot of people come to your site, well, but there's a risk component where if we don't do due diligence well, you know, there might be fraud on the platform and, and then people might get spooked. So we got to stay ahead of it. We have to be auditing all of these microfinance institutions in 42 countries, and that takes a huge budget. Um, but, you know, we, we, we would argue that even after doing that kind of auditing, um, for every dollar spent kind of running Kiva and doing the audits, you can unearth so much more from the internet community and so that there's still leverage on that. So that's, that's, that's the big thing that we're focused on in year three is basically raising money, hiring more people in the field, and doing a lot more random sampling and auditing of these field partners just to make sure that your money is being dutifully administered. That and then building a more uh, kind of addictive web application on the front end, so groups and other features that would actually make the site even more um, fun and compelling for, for folks. Videos, for example. A um, couple of things that this could be qualitatively in the future, if we really scale this, um, you know, imagine not only five years from now, but one generation from now when we're on our deathbeds and we're looking, we, we, and our dining, way, well, in my, in my kind of final moments, I'll probably be clicking around the Kiva site, and uh, you know, just like, just eBay, when it started, uh, you know, uh, I guess like 12 years ago, it was collectibles, it was Beanie Babies, it was, it was you know, very niche, right? And, and now today, um, more cars are sold through eBay than any other source on, in, in, on, on the planet. And so, you know, what could this be if we stewarded this um, 10, 15, 30 years? We have this compounding loan fund. What, what could it be? And a couple, a couple things that we, we, we can dream of right now. One is, what if lenders could actually make a rate of return um, and track micro-entrepreneurs like a true investment. Um, you know, if it's true that 40 to 60% of the developing world economy is in the informal sector, and there's really no way, I think, to play it right now, it'll be counter-cyclical to the market moves of the developing world economy. It'd be interesting if we could all play that. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship based on mutual dignity. You're an investor in this fruit stand. Um, I, I think it creates a persistent tie. It's also a controversial thing on the, uh, our community so far on the, on the chat rooms and message boards, don't like the idea of making a rate of return on Kiva. They think it almost kind of pollutes the idea of it. Just like Sonal and I are buddies, and if we go out to dinner tonight and she's like, hey, Premal, you know, I forgot my wallet, I would spot her 25 bucks and she would pay me back, but I wouldn't charge her interest because we have a personal connection. You could argue that Kiva is personalizing <laughs> these people right here, and you don't want to earn a rate of return. You would actually act, it's not a, a you know, your personal connection subsidizes the need for a financial return. So maybe offering interest rates on the website is a bad idea. In fact, just a quick show of hands, how many of you guys would be more likely to use Kiva if you could earn a rate of return um, by, in, by lending to um, a low-income entrepreneur? All right. So, and how many of you would be less likely to use Kiva um, if, um, if people were earning profits si side by side with you? How many of you would think it kind of ruins the brand or the internet public good nature of it? Okay. Make it a voluntary thing at the level of the entrepreneurs and have them, as they are successful, make small contributions to keep them. Okay. Open the possibility, invite them. Invite them in their dignity to help support Kiva. <coughs> yeah. So basically make it community driven and make it an option across all the people who are on the platform. Don't have Kiva kind of, you know, force anything. Just, you know, create the option for people to offer a return or not offer a return and accept a return or not accept a return. Okay? So, so what does the uh, return of this 
seem to attract parents giving it to their kids or uh, grandparents giving it to their grandkids as here's something we're, we're doing for the world and it, it's positive for you too. Sure. And get, the, get them involved not in managing a loss but managing a growth. So I think that's an interesting idea where we looked at uh, Emily's family, and they had a portfolio of like 1,100 loans. But you know, the average person might have a portfolio of two or three loans in their, in their portfolio. And you're saying that if there were a return on that, it would be plowed back in a, in a way of growing your own mini foundation as, as individual lenders on the Kiva website, and, and maybe even passing that on to a future generation. Another thing we could do would be to create group to group so, for example, you might have a church mm -hmm. that could collectively sponsor another church or another, you know, community organization and have that as a separate category. How much, this is one of the biggest debates within Kiva. I'm going to flip back to the website here. You'll see that there's a mix now. This is a new feature. We're allowing group loans. And um, one of the things that was debated internally, for example, here's a group in Uganda. Um, with 13 entrepreneurs is that people want to lend to one person. But what we saw on the website is when we posted these group loans, they were getting funded right away by, I mean, you can see all these people have funded this person, and this was just, just posted. So uh, you know, I, I, we, we're, we're still struggling with the idea. Maybe it's not a person-to-person -person website, but group-to-group -group would work, or person-to-group, -group, as long as you can see the, the human beings um, that are going to uh, benefit from your loan, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. There is another institution you may want to connect with. Okay. Trickle up. You may already know them. Sure. Uh, they are of the same vintage as Grameen. They may even be a little older. Uh, they have the advantage that, in addition to providing money, which they do on a grant basis, uh, they also provide. Uh, tutoring as to how to write a business plan and how to put a business together. But if you want money from Trickle Up, you have to have five people who are willing to commit 200 hours each for a year to qualify. Mm -hmm. And their success rate among entrepreneurs, and these are first time entrepreneurs all around the world, their success rate is around 65, 67% which blows Silicon Valley out of the water. <clears throat> and about a decade ago, they had started 23,000 businesses worldwide. So they have, some, they have something in their <clears throat> approach to this matter that if you could marry to Kiva, would not only provide capital, but training, education, etc. And would really bootstrap the whole the whole thing. Yeah, I think that's a you know people say that it's it's often beyond just credit that's needed. It's it's all, uh, it's obviously a multifaceted approach that um, would really address the the, the 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 core things. So training, health, um, you know, a, a, a number of things. And so, how does you know what's Kiva's role? And Kiva might not need to directly do that, but how do you bring in partners who could then basically do it because if Kiva can aggregation service of a lot of eyeballs and a lot of attention, then how do we start pulling in other partners who are doing what they do really well into the equation so that we can really make a real dent in poverty? Um, go ahead. Hi, I, I just wanted to clarify. Please help me understand uh, the, the microfinance institution. Um, they deliver the funds to the, the local entrepreneur, and does the microfinance institution uh, charge any rate of interest for that portion? They do. So the microfinance institution charges a rate of interest, and what we do is we screen just to make sure that it's not absorbent compared to the local market alternatives. Um, and um, you know, one thing that we really get excited about is actually, is over time, it's like two gas stations competing on the corner. When you can make information transparent, it keeps it starts applying downward pressure on. Um, the, the uh, you know whoever provides that service essentially and so the idea with Kiva is if we could hit a critical mass for example in Uganda or Tam in East Africa here um, literally not only could the internet public start shopping around and look for interest rate information as part of their criteria to, to make a loan 
but even entrepreneurs, as, as internet cafes kind of proliferate, could actually shop around for loans um, and kind of understand, oh wow, this one down the street actually has better terms, and, and, and that's, that's where we want to go once we hit a certain mass. The cost of capital is lower because they're borrowing because you just had, because they're not borrowing from Scambix at 17%, they lower their, their rate to the entrepreneur as well? Not in all cases. So it's something that, um, we initially set, we initially try to mandate that they lower their interest rate, pass on all the spread essentially to the micro entrepreneur. But the pushback that we got was some of these institutions aren't even self-sufficient yet. So they said, look, we can actually help more of the poor transform their lives if we hire more loan officers or we get an MIS system in place. It's really just um, let, let us use it for our operating budget and we'll provide accounting back to you about how we're using this extra spread. So after talking to a, a number of folks in the development community, that actually seemed like a much more enlightened approach. But what we need to do then is take exactly what they're doing and render that on the website so that the internet community can keep them accountable. And so that's, that's, there's, there, there still needs to be an accountability con uh, component to those commitments um, over the, in, in the time. Yes, um, I don't know, you might have told us, but when you get payback, is it payback based on the loaner's do dollar money? Or is it the loan ease money? Because they're they're different, right? And you can actually get payback even if you have, let's say, a zero investment if there's a depression in one currency and not in the other, or an inflation in the other. That's that's a great question. Currency. So it's, like, it's like arbitrage, a natural for the people arbitrage. Yeah. So let's look at. Um, well, let's just look at um, this group in Pakistan here, just to walk through that example here. So. Um, I should know this, but I don't know the currency in Pakistan. Anyone know what it is? Is it the rupee? Okay, great. So essentially, if you were to, you know, once we wire the $1,500 over to, I think it's Asasa here, uh, this organization, um, they will on lend it to these five women here. And um, let's say that the rupee declines 50%. In fact, it might have, uh, I'm sure there's some kind of devaluation of the Pakistani rupee because of the recent events there against the US dollar. Right now, Asasa is taking, bearing that loss. So they'll cover that currency risk loss because they lend it out in rupees and they get it back in rupees, but now they owe Kiva, the San Francisco-based organization, in original dollar amounts. And what we found is, again, as we, learn, as we stumble through this thing as a bunch of internet kids, um, we learned that that's actually not very, um, that's not responsible either because Asasa is a growing organization that is trying to lend to the poor for a social purpose. And this could actually put them out of business. So later this year, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give them a chance to check a box and explicitly add a disclaimer right down here in this massive white space that says, you, the internet lender, are gonna cover the currency risk. If you don't wanna cover it, pick another business. Again, just you know, you know, transparency around who takes on what risk I think is their solution here. Um, and since many people have a philanthropic mindset, I think a lot of people will accept the currency risk. Uh, go ahead. Um, I, uh, I noticed that there are a lot of parallels with what you're doing with what the industry's been doing for businesses for a long time. Uh, could you comment on uh, that similarity of, of, uh, of the two profiles? Sure. So. If, if Kiva can scale to a point where um, you know, there's, there's a critical mass, certainly these five women, the, next, the way microfinance works is usually your biggest incentive really to repay is access to a future loan. So what, what we're happening, uh, what's happening is that you know, these five women, once they kind of you know, a year from now pay back this loan, they'll likely get another loan and it'll probably be posted up on the Kiva website. So the idea is to actually track each one of these women and kind of, you know, if they have a national ID code, be basically try to create for the developing world um, a, cr a credit bureau. And it's an online portable credit bureau. So if this woman moves from, you know, Pakistan down to India, she could, and, and you know, moves to another village essentially, uh, uh, her reputation is not all lost. It's not all trapped in that village. Ideally, she could actually point to this website, which is a very public website on her repayment history, and say, hey, look, I've repaid four loans on Kiva. You know, here's you can actually verify all this data. Um, you know, I'd like to apply for a fifth loan from you, formal sector bank. So that's where we would like to go. And then long term, you know, if we could actually become, um, you know, 
a credit bureau or append our information to local credit bureaus that may be in development, I think that would just be incredibly valuable. For the investors, too, you're providing also uh, a qualification uh, for a Yes, so for example, one, one thing that some of the microfinance institutions have said, so for example, in Kenya, I believe we have about eight or nine microfinance institutions. And um, one of the concerns expressed, but I thought this is really interesting, this is exactly what you want out of, out of an internet platform, is that microfinance institutions will poach each other's entrepreneurs, and they'll find which, but that's, that information's powerful. If you're credit worthy and you run a great business, you should get loans at better terms. And that's, that's what's missing today for one half of the Earth's population. So, you know, this is exactly what we intend to do is create that competition, that information flow. It seems to me that longer term, one of the uh, side benefits of, of this is that it could change the culture of corruption. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because people, this is a real life example of why not being corrupt pays dividends. And you're involving institutions as well as people. And it could very quickly transform a society, I would think. The, the key thing is that it's because it's a loan and not a donation, I believe. Because you can self-report anything, but unless you show me the money, the money if, if the money doesn't come back, I mean, you could report all these great things happening, but once the money comes back, then you know, like, there, it, it, it tells you a level of corruption and embezzlement and fraud that did not occur, essentially, if you're actually getting the money wired back. Um, and so that's why, you know, I think it's okay if we all accept the currency risk, which we can track on CNN, and if we accept, you know, borrower default risk and, 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 and do it at 0% interest, so long as you can trust the data. I think that's just a huge step forward for, uh, the, you know, these economies, essentially. Um, how about way in the back? Um, great question. Um, we haven't done that data analysis yet. This would be a great thing, but here are the different buckets, you know, ranging from agriculture, um, uh, you know, manufacturing, retail, health. Um, I can, uh, you know, I was, I was spitting out a few statistics around what tends to be popular, but agriculture is definitely the most popular um, on the website. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that would that'd be a great data project to, to run um, at some point. Uh, how about also just starting in the back? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so this actually, uh, this question actually brings me to one of the issues I had with group lending because I was actually doing some money over the weekend. And you look at a group loan and, you know, primary activity, food preparation, and then when you look at the details of what the different people in the group are doing, you've got a restaurant owner, a bicycle taxi, somebody making clothes, and while you want to support these people, you find yourself wondering, what kind of activity am I supporting? And I found that actually sort of a turnoff about group loans, so I finally found some individual borrowers and lent to them on, you know, kinds of activity I thought made sense. So that's just sort of one of my concerns about, um, well, what I'll call group borrowing, yeah. um, as opposed to group lending when the church gets together, which I actually think is a neat idea, but um, it's just, it confuses things a bit. If you had a way of getting five people together who were in a similar kind of activity or who were in an activity together, um, like three people who run a cafe or something. That's, yeah, I, I hear you. It, um, it, it, makes the, the, it makes things less clean when they're group loans because they tend to do individual activities. They tend to sometimes um, not all be the same gender, and so we have some data issues around that. Um, just to keeping going from the back here, okay, go ahead. Uh, giving your background in PayPal, uh, have you considered uh, using the money uh, that you hold as a float to actually support the organizational costs? So suppose that rather than delivering the loan right away, you held it in a float for like 15 days or 30 days uh, before you delivered the loan. So would that help you pay given the scale? No, it's a it's a, you know, I think the original business plan had float as being the way that Kiva would pay for ourselves until we realized we had to audit this stuff. And we're like, oh my god, these audits cost us so much money. Like, how do you audit businesses in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is where we are today? I mean, that's really expensive, but it's really important to deliver that trust to the internet community. So um, luckily, what's a couple things. Float doesn't, um, we don't keep the money very long. We think that we should just actually pass through as quickly as possible to the end beneficiary. Um, 
um, the way that we make money is every time you make a loan, we, we pitch you um, to make a small donation to Kiva. And we tell you 100% of your loan goes to that entrepreneur. That's true. We're not going to siphon anything off. But if you want to put in an extra, pony up an extra 10% for Kiva, um, you know, when Ticketmaster does this, they charge a service fee. People complain because it's mandatory. But with, again, the irony, I think, is because Kiva is just like, we're not, we're, you know, you can skip it if you want. You know, again, 70% of people are choosing to donate an, an additional 10%. And that's really been helpful. Um, and then some foundations have now started coming in and, and private individuals to kind of give us a lot more growth capital to scale our operations faster. Uh, just, I'm going to use the back to front method for a second. So, uh, right there. Uh, you, sir. Uh, I have a question about the role of the uh, NGO in the, company, in the other country. Uh, you implied <coughs> initially that one of the goals might be to eliminate that person and get more efficient or something like that. Right. Where it seems to me the role of that uh, organization <coughs> might be to help select people, to find those people, to check and see if they're reliable, to make sure everything they say is true, yes. to make sure they even exist. Few things like that. So I, I, I think that the goal should not be that. It should be, in fact, to take more advantage of those people and, and, and find better people to uh, do that job. I, I think, um, in a short and medium term, I couldn't agree with you more. The big problem right now is that one in five to about one in ten of the people, I'm sorry, four in five to kind of nine out of ten folks who need uh, access to affordable financial services can't get it. Of, of the two billion people on Earth who live on less than two dollars a day, um, there's an incredible population that's still underserved. And what 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 you need are healthy institutions, these small community banks, these microfinance institutions, who can reach the rural areas and who can actually provide at least some capital, either competing with the money lender where they exist, or you know if there is no money lender, providing that capital. So. I agree with you. I think one of the exciting things, though, about technology is if you can still hit that goal of reach and disintermediate uh, things in the middle, that would bring the interest rate down over time. But to disintermediate, um, you know, Narcisa here in Peru, uh, who runs an embroidery uh, uh, business here, um, you know, basically right now, this is from Microfinanza Prisma in Peru. But um, you know, one day, what if she took out four loans through Kiva, through Microfinance and Prisma, and there were a way that she could actually post up her fifth loan herself. And we had some identity check mechanism. Um, maybe instead of Prisma charging her a you know, 20% interest rate for this you know, low interest loan, relatively low interest loan, she could access it through the website at 0% interest. I mean, it, it just, the end goal is to reach more entrepreneurs in the developing world at lower interest rates. And so disintermediation, at some point when it becomes technologically feasible could be interesting. Um, but I just think it's, um, it's, it's far from now. And right now, the big goal is to actually just make sure that she has access to some loan whatsoever, which requires these institutions. And so I, maybe I was confu confusing the future visionary stuff with the practical thing of the next you know, few years. But uh, all right, uh, in the red, uh, you. Yes. Um, since you're growing so quickly right now, My concern is uh, the whole pyramid scheme idea. If yeah. certain lending institutions are getting more money, could they be keeping their rates up by simply paying back out of the new money they're getting in and not? And the, it, it's the whole transparency getting correct out of idea. Yeah, the the, the 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 Ponzi scheme risk and the pyramid scheme risk is a very real risk. Um, in fact, uh, uh, in Uganda, uh, we had two hundred forty thousand dollars embezzled. Um, and we emailed the 5,000 internet lenders who were affected by that, and we just said, hey, look, here's what happened. Um, and you know, we caught it, and the way you catch that is you have to do random sampling. So we would go to Microfinan uh, Microfinanza Prisma in Peru, and we'd send an auditor there, and over the course of two to three weeks, they'd visit a random sample of about 30 to 60 entrepreneurs on the Kiva website, ensuring that the money that they received is in the amount stated on the site, that their loan use is and, and so on and so forth. And if we find anything wrong, essentially, then we make that transparent on the website and we terminate the partnership with the NGO. So that's, 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 that's our method and we're just trying to, you know, it's very, we've actually limited our growth. So I don't know if you folks have noticed this, but the New York Times Magazine, Sunday Magazine, had an article out last two weeks ago. This used to be limited to $25 and we frequently run out of businesses on the website for people to fund. Why? Not because there's not enough 
uh, entrepreneurs in the developing world that could be posted on the website, but because we didn't feel comfortable from a risk perspective that, you know, um, that this person was, you know, duly who, who they say they were. So we've actually limited our own growth because we don't want to take, we don't want to hurt the brand of Kiva. Like this is something that has to really mean trust um, for people over the long term. And we'll make a lot of mistakes between now and, and then, but we want to minimize that kind of, that, that, those bad experiences. Um, how about you just come in uh, with that? Yeah. Uh, you, to get back to the currency risk, you mentioned the idea of transferring the currency risk to the uh, local dollar lender. That would increase the demand for loans from high inflationary countries because they would just be repaying and devaluing local currency. And I think it might even dry up the supply when I know I'm going to be back, get paid back half of what I put in, say, if there's 100 percent inflation. So maybe you could let the local microfinance institutions set their own terms linking the principal to some kind of index, maybe a cost of living index, mm -hmm. so that the risk is shared among all the participants and not borne just by one end of the uh, equation. <coughs> yeah, and I, you know, I think the, uh, that's a great idea, and what I'd like to see is a microfinance institution experiment with that approach, make that transparent on the website, so when you're reading her profile, you'd see that, that, that this business, if I do that, I'm sharing the risk with them, and then we would let the internet community effectively vote on that idea versus other ideas of handling the currency risk. So, yeah. Um, how about all the way just in the back, just. Uh, does one get any uh, psychic benefit from uh, having these loans made? In, the, in other words, uh, uh, aside from taking the risk of not getting paid back and not receiving any interest, uh, does the borrower have any sense of where the money's coming from and does that do any good? So um, in, in all cases, we ask that the microfinance institution, obviously because they're taking a photo of the borrower at the, at the place that they're working, that they're informed about the fact that they're being posted up onto an internet website. Because the privacy of this individual and consent of this individual is absolutely, absolutely key. So these entrepreneurs are aware of that. Now some microfinance institutions have found that they're a little nervous that if, um, you know, for example, if gringos are funding me, how, what happens to the repayment dynamic in that community. So it, it's too soon to tell. The data suggests that it's not so bad. Um, and, you know, you know, I think long term, um, I mean, we, ha we have a lot of examples of, you know, um, um, a, a tortilla stand um, that basically has on kind of the refrigerator basically a magnet with all their lenders right there. Um, and so, like, you know, you, you see those examples as well. But um, you know, it's, it's varying, and I, I think over the years, what I'd like to see is, I mean, when the technology's there, um, MMS video uploads right from the field, like a message, like it's like an analyst call where she can talk about her business. Even if it's in Spanish, I still think it's wonderful content. She can talk about it, maybe we have an, you know, an interpreter from you know, a local high school, basically. Like, you, know, you can pull this all together in like a multi-web chat. Like, this is not hard. Um, because it's, you know, the technology is there, we just haven't, we don't have enough people to kind of really make that happen yet, but it can happen. And that's what I like to see is, you know, really she's kind of broadcasting the results of her business. And, and you know, just like you folks are kind of, kind of offering suggestions on what we, Kiva, could do better, it'd be fantastic if the internet community could be interacting with the entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, I don't know, so. Uh, go ahead, sir. Okay, so it's just, Money tracking question, $1,000 loan comes up, I'm gonna loan $1,000. How much of that 1,000 actually reaches these folks and how much do these folks actually pay back? 100% of your $1,000 loan gets to that person. And then how much they pay back is $1,000 is, is $1, plus an interest rate. Typically, right now on the website, I think it's around 20%. Okay, so 12, they paid 1,200 bucks back, but That's they got the 1,000 off. So the microfinance guys didn't take anything out of the way in. They That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, um, you? Okay. Um, just, uh, this kind of ties into the, one of the previous questions. So at the end of, like, I think this loan is for six months or something. So, yeah. uh, so at the end of that, do, what do I see? story posted about I used it and I did the best and everything, I was successful or I wasn't successful and why? Yeah, exactly. So what we require of each microfinance institution is what we call this journal update. And so you'll get in, in your inbox 
not only will you get these kind of monthly you've got cash emails, right, that say, hey, you know, let's say you lend 20, you know, I don't know, $100, uh, six month loan term, I don't know, what is that, $13 every month or something like that is what you'd get back, am I right? Um, or eight, um, sorry, my math is horrible. Um, um, very embarrassing in front of this crowd. Yeah, it, it, this is why. Um, so anyways, so anyways, um, not only that though, so not only to get con quantitative financial information, like money, but you also will get a story or two. Um, and what we're finding right now is that um, the compliance of these microfinance institutions around providing a social impact story, it's still not ex as high as we'd like it to be. So what we did is we created a program called the Kiva Fellows Program, which I want to pitch right now. It lets you, if you want to do an internship in microfinance, we've got a lot of opportunities. Basically, we need folks to go out to one of these 42 countries and work with the microfinance institution on basically documenting the lives of these entrepreneurs. And so we've sent about 80 people, about one third recent college grad, one third recent grad school grads, and one third kind of mid-career professional slash retirees. And um, it's a minimum of 10 weeks, and you go out there, you pay for it yourself, but we'll place you, uh, we'll train you, and then we'll place you, and then you basically go out, hop on the motorbike with that loan officer every day, and you basically have stories of impact or lack of impact of these loans, and you publish it, you blog about it on the Kiva website. And that provides the internet community more information, which keeps them coming back and lending more. So Kiva Fellows Program, if you're interested, please come talk to me. Uh, actually, I, I'm going to go right back to the back again, sir. Hold on a second. Uh, all the way in the back. Um, the answer today is um, not, not as great as it, it could be. So what you can do is you can basically provide comments. Um, so for example, you know, Moses, here's a journal, right? Kind of a running journal posted on July 28th. There were three comments um, posted from the internet community. And then the loan officer would read those comments and pass them back to the entrepreneur. But the future, I guess, would be much more real time you know, um, uh, real-time communication. Um, one question is, is, you know, how much would they value the advice of outsiders? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's one question I have. But, um, but you, know, it, it, you know, you're seeing kind of, you know, general comments right now. They could probably be a much more richer interaction, I think, as, as we get a little more mature and stable as a company, you get the technology really rolling through here. Of course, the other issue with comments is translation. Yes. Absolutely, because this, you know, this is, well, this is Kenya, so it's English speaking, but absolutely right. Um, but Google Translator, you know, I mean, like, there, again, technology can do these things, I believe. Um, it can really bring it on the cost of, of providing a very rich experience on both ends. Uh, okay, uh, just one more question. How about um, all the way in, uh, um, you in the brown shirt in the back? So what's your competition? You've got, uh, on one hand, seed bank Well, I, I think the big competition is ignorance and inactivity. <laughs> I, I mean, um, you know, most people, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, that, that, is, that is really the, uh, what's, what's interesting, uh, let me give you a statistic on that. Um, if 20,000 people, well, basically, only 3% of the people who visit the site actually make a loan. Many people will talk about it but they won't make the loan. So it's that inactivity, that indifference, it's you know, why other people vote, but I don't vote, that's one thing. But in terms of alternatives to actually participating in this, there is a few uh, options. Uh, the first is you can go to Calvert uh, or some of these other socially responsible investment funds and make a loan to uh, these microfinance institutions at the fund level. Um, there you can actually make a donation through websites like Global Giving, which it's not a loan, but you can actually donate to a specific project. Um, there is a new site put out by eBay called Microplace, which basically works with Calvert 
um, and you can actually make an, uh, investments at the institutional level. Um, Prosper.com, if you want to do domestic microfinance, is a site that you might want to check out. Um, it's, you can earn a rate of return, um, and um, you know, that's one way you can do, do that. Um, I think increasingly what we'll see on the internet is more kind of more f traditional f philanthropic models using the internet and community to actually g gain more excitement around it. And you can do this, who's doing the Kiva for the education space? Who's doing the Kiva for you know, the healthcare space? Like I think you can kind of replicate this kind of very personal one-to-one -one model. Um, and there's some attempts out there, but those are a few names. Oh, Prosper. Prosper. Yeah, that's that's uh, person to person microfinance in the United States. Uh, Lending Club is another one that lets you lend to a specific person here in the U.S. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. One of the concerns that uh, I've read about is with these microfinance institutions is that they are now so anxious to go up in their reputation and high payback level and that kind of thing that they end up strong arming some of the lenders. Is that something you have thought about or, or wondered about? Or yeah. Are seeing that they, you know, they're so concerned that you know they not get negatively rated that they are brutal with the with the people that take the money. I think that's the flip side of, of this whole thing. I mean, in some ways, um, are credit cards in the U.S. good or bad? You know, I think there's so much nuance around this, and so. You know, our, our position is that ideally what we can do is make this tran everything transparent. So if there's strong arming tactics, right, not only are they're, they self-reporting data to the website, but you as a Kiva fellow, you're out there in the field with them, and you're observing that, and you're videotaping it, and you're writing about it, and you're posting that up on the website. And it's the way I think to solve it is by basically exposing it on a very public platform. So I'm absolutely positive that a lot of this credit is accompanied with um, you know, basically terms that aren't pro-poor. And the, the only way, but they can report that they are pro-poor and they can have a glossy brochure about it. And that, this happens all the time. And so the goal is to basically just have data that's self-reported and verified and self-reported and verified and basically have it on, on a highly visible place so you can actually, you know, um, expose that, that kind of practice. Okay. Do you, Okay, just, um, I guess, uh, one last question, and probably someone, how, how about um, you, Miss, uh, right there? Yeah, um, I don't know if you mentioned this, the discovery process, but what is the rate of success of, if you have that data, of those that are successfully funded, and do you provide them with safe or reasonable loans? In the case of the day, can you resolve some scales for the company? So, right now, um, basically on the website, there's a couple ways to measure success. And then there are a couple of ways that um, you can't really measure quantitatively success. You just you can get a qualitative feel for it, and we hope to be more quantitative in the future. Um, um, one measure of success is the delinquency and default rate. So, did I get the loan back or not? Um, which would indicate whether or not that loan generated sufficient income, ideally, to actually repay the creditor. Um, so, so far on um, the the delinquency rate, which is those loans that are kind of 30 days past due is around 2.5 to 3%. Um, so in other words, 97% of the active loans are being repaid on time. Um, and then the default rate or the write-off rate um, is less than 1% right now. Um, I think long-term, it'll, it'll, you know, the delinquency rate is a good proxy for where it'll be um, long-term. Um, and that's typical in microfinance, it's kind of a high 90s uh, repayment rate. Um, in terms of... Um, the Kenya and, and you know so for example if you loan to a business in Iraq there's a big disclaimer that says this is a highly volatile situation you really might not get your money back but those businesses get funded in two hours on the site because people again it's a it's almost a it's a highly risk tolerant um, impact seeking crowd that's hitting our website right now and so um, it actually the, the it seems like there's a correlation of rate of funding and crisis um, which is which is guiding where we actually want to work. We're now we're looking for places that are post-conflict or are, are currently in a conflict as as being uh, kind of the places that the internet community wants to fund the most. Um, okay, and uh, that's that's curtains for me. Thank you so much for uh, for, for for being here.